so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. When Michelle Steck met Kevin East at a Perth shopping centre in 1989, he seemed like a successful, put-together gentleman. At 19, she was just starting her career after having studied and travelled extensively. And this chance encounter with a charming older man had her totally smitten. But it's an encounter that would set Michelle on the path to a tragedy that would make her life almost unbearable. Michelle had always wanted children, and when she fell pregnant early on in her relationship with East, despite her fledgling career, she was keen to have the baby and explore life as a mum. But even in those early stages, East's true personality had started to show. Coercive control wasn't a phrase we knew or really understood in the early 1990s, but that's exactly what Michelle was facing. East was jealous, quick to anger, and would constantly accuse Michelle of infidelities that had never occurred. Her circle of friends and family support dwindled as he made it increasingly more difficult for them to have a relationship with Michelle. He made it clear they weren't welcome in his home and she needed his permission to go anywhere. He tracked her every move, questioned why she wasn't where he thought she should be, He also controlled the finances, making Michelle beg for funds for the smallest things. She tried to leave when things turned violent, but like many men who see women as their property, East lured her back with promises of change. They had another child, this time a boy, little Wesley. But by this stage, things were getting even more dangerous for Michelle. Despite the threats to her life, Michelle knew she had to go. What would unfold in the weeks and months after she left East would read like the plot of a horror film. Stalking, spying and an unravelling of a man who was furious that he couldn't have his own way. Kevin East would then do something horrific that only a select group of domestic violence perpetrators, mostly men, have done to get back at their partners who dare to leave them. It's called retaliatory filicide, and it would leave a vulnerable little girl, just three years old, at the mercy of a violent and abusive father who wanted to use her to get back at her mum. I'm Claire Murphy, and this is True Crime Conversations a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. And over the next month, we're going to be examining four separate cases of retaliatory filicide, starting with the story of Michelle Steck and her daughter Kelly. You're going to pay for your actions for a long time. That's what little Kelly East's father said to her mother Michelle when she had made it clear that she would not be returning to their violent and controlling relationship. She would have no idea just how true those words would be. Motivated by spite and a desire to pay her back for the supposed wrong she had done him, Kevin East would commit an act that would inflict a lifetime of grief and suffering on Michelle. Statistics show that in Australia, one woman a week is killed in an episode of domestic violence. And data from a 12-year study published in 2019 found that one child is killed every two weeks by a biological parent or step-parent. These murders can be attributed to mental health issues, neglect and a history of domestic violence. But there's a select group of these deaths which fall under the category of retaliatory filicide. While there have been documented cases of mothers killing their own children out of revenge, the perpetrators are overwhelmingly men. One UK-based study found most offenders are men aged in their 30s, and an Australian study found the most dangerous day for children in these situations 
is a Sunday, the day that dads have to hand them back to their mothers after access visits. And that's where Michelle Steck found herself, waiting for Kevin East to return their daughter from a weekend visit, waiting for her little girl who would never come home. Megan Norris is a journalist whose portfolio includes covering some of Australia's most infamous crimes. She is also an award-winning author who wrote the book Look What You Made Me Do, Fathers Who Kill, which outlines Australian cases of retaliatory filicide. She joins us now. So, Megan, let's start right from the beginning of Michelle Steck's story. How did she meet Kevin East? She met him by chance in a local shopping mall in Perth. She was a young 19-year-old working in a big corporate office in a, I think it was for a mining company, and she had gone to get a coffee and met this charming old man in a cafe. And it was just a chance encounter. And he was telling her that he was divorced and he gave her a bit of a sob story, which looking back, she said should have been a, a red flag in itself. But he was telling her this story about how his wife had shafted him and it was all over and he couldn't get a woman. And she was looking at this handsome, distinguished, successful businessman thinking, how come? You're a lovely guy, you're charming. And that's how she met him. And who was Kevin East? to his community? What did he do for a living and how did he present himself to those around him and in his circle? He was immaculate. She said that was one of the things that struck her about him. He was an immaculate dresser. He was a super smart, accomplished businessman. He was an electronics expert, which actually she found out later to her own dismay that he was much better at computer electronics and surveillance and stuff than she ever would have imagined. And that sort of worked against her later in the marriage. But, you know, she said he was dapper, he was charming, he was popular, or so he seemed. And it was a whirlwind romance of a teenage girl swept off her feet by this successful businessman. So just how whirlwind are we talking here? So there's quite an age gap. He's in his 30s. She's 19 years old. How quickly do they shift their relationship into serious territory, move in together? Almost right away, they were seeing each other. She said they sort of became inseparable. It was a really full-on, intense romance, and she was swept away by him. And in no time, he'd convinced her they got a house together in Forest Hill, a suburb of Perth. And she was working in her own career. She was very focused. It was a big corporate job for a young girl. And she was ambitious and going places, and he was ambitious and going places. And it seemed to be a perfect match to begin with. You know, she'd got her independence and her money and her freedom, her income. And that all worked quite well to begin with. But she got pregnant very quickly into that relationship. So I would have been within months she was having her first child. So she falls pregnant and she now has to reassess herself as does she continue on with her career? Does she stay at home and be a stay-at-home mother? How does that all play out within her very, very new relationship? Well, she said at first he was thrilled to become a father. He was very excited about the baby and so was she. All she'd ever wanted was to become a mother. But she was a typical 90s young woman. She wanted it all. She wanted to work as well and have a baby. But she didn't want to bolt back to work. She wanted time. And so when the baby was born, she said he was a very attentive dad. Well, superficially, you know, he was very happy to show the baby off to people, but he wasn't very hands on. She wanted to go back to work, but he absolutely demanded that she went back to work. And she was still breastfeeding. So she wasn't keen to go straight back to work while she was still feeding the baby. And that became a bone of contention. He wanted her to put the new baby in childcare. And she said, no, I won't do it. I'm still feeding. I'm nursing the baby myself. I want to give her a little bit more time and then I'll go back. And that caused massive arguments. Things were already starting to go wrong. So even by the time she'd fallen pregnant, the veneer with him was beginning to crumble. So he was doing things like he went to one of her work's dues and picked a fight on a colleague. I think it was one of the bosses, accused him of flirting with Michelle challenged him to a fight in the car park outside the venue that they'd gone to and just totally embarrassed her. So she'd had to give that job up because of his behaviour at that party. And it wasn't her fault, but she just felt so ashamed. So she'd given that job up and had a different job. And then she was pregnant, so she left anyway to have the baby. 
but he really wanted her to go back to work and he wanted her to do it now. It was about the money. And she said, no, I'd rather be without the money and wait a little longer. And that became a source of friction in the relationship. Was it really all about the finances or was there any evidence that Kevin was jealous of Michelle's relationship with Kelly, their new baby? Yeah, both. It was certainly that too. He was very resentful of the time she spent. And he'd started to do things while she was at home with the baby. He rang and he rang and he rang. It was repeated, constant, intrusive phone calls. She said she'd lose count of them. It would be constant. Who have you talked to today? Who have you seen today? Where have you been? Have you been anywhere? She's saying, no, I haven't had any opportunity to do anything. I'm looking after the baby. And if she didn't take his calls immediately, he would be very angry. And that would cause an argument. So she was in this perpetual state of anxiety of trying to meet the baby's needs and trying to meet his. And he was demanding, call me back. Where have you been? What are you doing? Who's there? And no one was there. And then she'd say, you know, she might need to nick to the shops to get formula or to get something for the baby. And she then realized he was actually checking the odometer on her car before he left for work. And again, when he got home, and challenging her about where she'd been. And he could tell how far she'd been by that obsessive sort of controlling behavior. And it got to the point where she actually left him when the baby was little and went to her mother's in Collie, which is a good two hours drive away. And she went there. And even when she visited mum, he would allocate her a time to arrive at her mother's. He would estimate the journey. And then he would call her before she left And he would call her again. This is the days before mobiles. He would call her at the house. And if she wasn't there, he'd be furious. It seemed to her like he wanted to control everything right down to the traffic. You know, she said it was ridiculous. I couldn't account for there being a holdup or a delay or an accident or traffic lights. And he would just be furious. And she said it all got a bit much and she left him. But her mum was sort of, you know, you've made your bed, lie in it. You know, it's a relationship, they take work, you need to go back, a child needs their dad. And so she was sort of pressured into coming back. But in her heart, even at that early on, she knew things were not right. She does go back to him and they go on to have a second child, Wesley, who's born in 1991, a son. Does Wesley's arrival again change the dynamic for this young family? Yes, it was getting more controlling. His behaviour by then was she felt it was stifling. She was quite depressed. He accused her of having an affair with one of his relatives because they were chatting at a party. If she joined in, because she'd travelled quite a bit before she met him. So if she joined in the conversation about travels, I think they were talking about holidays, he became become very resentful about her engaging in the conversation and wanted to close her down. And he would do that by accusing her of hitting on the cousin or whoever it was she was supposed to be hitting on a an in-law, which wasn't the case, and she was mortified. He ruined one of his relatives' birthdays by causing an ugly scene and accusing her of having a thing for one of the relatives, which embarrassed everybody because it wasn't true. And he would do things like if she was giving attention or joining in a conversation, he would go and wake the baby. He would deliberately wake the baby, make the baby cry, and then she would have to stop being part of the conversation and go and deal with the baby. And it would take her ages to get the baby back to sleep. And he was doing that quite deliberately. So he's controlling her time where she is with the children already. Is he also coercively controlling her? And that terminology did not exist in the 1990s when this was all happening. But did that coercive control extend to finances as well? Was she restricted with money? Yes, he kept her short of money. You find that in a lot of those cases that I wrote about, the balance of power shifted when women became pregnant and left their jobs. So when they don't have their own income, and she said she really hated because she'd been very independent, very ambitious, very self-sufficient. And she's a strong woman. You know, she is not a weak lady by any means and never was. And she said he was controlling the finances. So she would have to ask for every cent. You know, if she needed a haircut, she had to ask. If she wanted to go somewhere, she needed money for petrol. And she started squirreling the odd $5 and hiding it. I think she hid it under the carpet, but she used to hide money in the house. And that almost became her escape fund. So she must have known at some level it wasn't going to last. She wasn't going to be able to continue to live in that controlling environment. 
He was accusing her of having affairs she hadn't had, putting her down, a lot of name calling. He alienated the family. So all those common features, which we now know, come under the umbrella coercive controlling behaviours, financial abuse, emotional abuse, calling her names, telling her she's hopeless, putting her down, controlling her movements when he's there and when he isn't with all those intrusive phone calls. And then when she complained about that, he would say, well, that's just a sign of how much I love you. But it didn't feel like love. It felt stifling. And a lot of the women I interviewed described that conflicting feeling of, is that what love is? Doesn't feel like love. It feels suffocating. And so you start to doubt yourself. And he was gaslighting her and saying things to her like, you know, well, if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't be so angry. But it also started to become physical, pushing and shoving and it started to become very physical. Well, let's talk about that because up until that point, it had been coercive control. Now, there really hadn't been a physical altercation between them. But what happened when Michelle's younger sister visited from Collie where she'd grown up? Well, that's where it started to turn really ugly. So he started to marginalise the family. And that's another thing that I saw in nearly all of these cases, especially where there's coercive control. One of the biggest things is alienating you from your friendship network and particularly from members of your family that you would confide in. So he stopped the family coming round. Then he made it that they had to seek his permission to come round. So Michelle would have to get his advance consent for her mum to visit. And when they came, he was belligerent and difficult and unfriendly and unwelcoming. So they were discouraged from coming. But the, the younger sister, who was about 14 or 15, she caught the bus from Collie and came and Michelle went to meet her. And Michelle was very excited to have a little bit of company. When he got in from work, the sister was there and he was absolutely livid that she had come unannounced without his prior permission. And in front of this young sister, he attacked Michelle and threw her against the wall. And the sister was so distraught, she was only about 14, that she literally fled from the house and rung her mother to come and collect her. Now, mum had to make a huge round trip from Collie in the Darling Ranges all the way to Forest Hill in Perth to collect the sister and take her home. So that was deeply distressing and humiliating for Michelle. And that was the sort of turning point. It was starting to get very ugly. And he was bold enough to do it in front of people. So Michelle's sister witnesses this happen. Her mum knows that this has happened. And in fact, her grandmother, who then moves into the area, sort of sees this happening to her granddaughter as well and tells her to leave Kevin. But at any stage up to this point, have police been involved in Michelle and Kevin's relationship at all? No. And it was one of those things where Michelle sort of thought that was her lot. There's also that general erosion of confidence when you're constantly put down and told you're hopeless and kept short of money and treated like a slave. There's that general depletion of that confidence. And she had been a very confident, independent young woman. Suddenly she's at his beck and call. She's doing everything she's taught. And she feels hopeless for almost allowing that to happen. So she felt like part of the problem. No, she hadn't been to the police but she was starting to get scared of him and she was getting tired of it too. And she's quite feisty. So she would have argued back. She said there were a lot of arguments because she knew it wasn't right and she was challenging him. So Michelle has squirreled away these $5 notes under the carpet. She's got herself a little bit of a freedom fund. She decides she's had enough. She tries to leave him for a second time. What happened? Well, she finally decided when Wesley was a young baby that she'd had enough. She couldn't continue and didn't want to continue to live like that. She knew she had to get out. And after that first beating, there were other violent altercations too. So she decided she was going to leave no matter what, and she was going to make a life for herself. And she was going to go back to Collie and be closer to her family, by which time, you know, she'd got no family network. And he was accusing her of having affairs all the time. So she started to wonder if maybe he was having affairs. And it was a projection thing because he was constantly accusing her of having affairs where she wasn't actually leaving the house because she couldn't do anything he didn't know about. So she was suspicious that he might be having an affair. There were a lot of absences from the home at that stage. And she overheard she was spying on a conversation that he was having in a spare room. And she actually caught him having phone sex with some anonymous woman on a hotline 
And that for her was the final straw. It caused a massive argument. And she didn't know that that was a hotline. She wondered if that was an affair. He said it wasn't. He said it was some stranger that he called some number. So she said, well, either way, I've had enough. That's it. Final straw. I'm leaving. So on the day she told him she was leaving, he went absolutely ballistic. He attacked her. He disappeared out of the house and came back with a length of rope. He hogtied her. And she was screaming so much. And this was all in front of the children. So Kelly was a little girl, a toddler then, and the baby was a few months old. So mum was screaming, the children were screaming in distress. So he gagged her, stuffed something in her mouth to stop her screaming, and proceeded to kick her from one end of the room to the other. He kicked her black and blue. And he left her hogtied on the kitchen floor, bleeding and injured, with Kelly clinging to her, and stormed out of the house and left her like that. And she was on that floor for hours before he came back. True to the absolute spirit that Michelle has shown both then and since, she doesn't let that stop her plan from happening. She decides that if that wasn't the final nail in the coffin, what would be? So she still plucks up her courage and leaves him. It confirmed everything she believed that it was getting more dangerous that she was not prepared to live like that and she was going to take the children and leave. And she left a couple of weeks later. So this happened right before Christmas in 1992. And she left on New Year's Day 1993. And she took the children and went back to Collie, to her mother's. And she thought she'd get away from him and figure it out from there. But she left with his threats ringing in her ears. He said, basically, Nobody does that to me. You know, you can't do this. You don't get to decide to leave me. You're going to pay for this for a long time. But he'd made so many threats in the sort of final days of the relationship. They were not married, but in the final days of the relationship, he was constantly threatening her, constantly threatening to hurt her and actually doing it and making all sorts of threats that she got to a stage where she said she was almost desensitized. She just thought, oh, whatever, I'm still going. And she left and thought it was just more of his threats. And once she was out of reach, he wouldn't be able to do anything more to her. So in a way that we see a lot of these situations play out with someone who is a coercive, controlling person, he offers to help her out as she moves out to Collie because she's getting into a new house and it needs a little bit of work and he's all being very generous and saying, look, I'll give you a hand. But what is he actually doing to that house under the guise of helping her. When she moved out, she went back to her mum's to begin with while she regrouped and figured out what she was going to do. And she decided then she was going to get a small place of her own close to mum's house where she could see her sister and be close to the family. So she found herself an old house in Collie, logging town in the Darling Ranges, you know, a coal mining town. So she found herself a little place that needed a bit of work doing on it. And she was really broke because The little bit of money she'd saved wasn't much at all, really wasn't anything. And she couldn't work. So she found this little house. It needed rewiring. And by then, she thought he appeared to be coming around to the fact that the relationship was finally over. So she thought. And he was driving out to visit the kids. So she sort of thought that things were on the up, that he was actually accepting that she'd left. And she was trying to keep it nice as well, trying to make it smooth so that she didn't upset him she was worried about upsetting him so she got this place and he offered to come around and do some rewiring work and she didn't really want him to do it but she couldn't afford to pay anyone and she figured okay well he's an electronics expert he can do that he used the opportunity though to install listening devices all over the house and bugged her phone the landline so that he could tune into her conversations. There was a block over the road, a bush block. He was hiding in the bush block, listening to her conversations. So he would know exactly who she was talking to, what she was doing. And he was also listening to her phone calls as well. And she had no idea he had done that. And it was at that sort of stage that things started to unravel. He started to unravel. So he was coming to see the kids and she'd met another young guy. And he clearly knew about that. That really sent him off the edge because it was also a sign she wasn't coming back. So she was starting to get worried about him. He was turning up and this man had been an immaculate, in control guy, in control of everyone, including himself. He was turning up 
not shaved, dishevelled, his clothes were not looked after, he was not looking after. He had a tattoo, which, you know, he hated tattoos. Suddenly he has a tattoo, he's turning up drunk, he's doing all sorts of things. So she started to get very worried about his mental health and whether or not he was actually fit to be looking after two small children because he'd not been very hands-on. So she complained about that and she stopped him seeing the kids for a while. And the unravelling continued. When she stopped him seeing the kids, he was furious. He saw a lawyer and they were referred to mediation to try and resolve it amicably. And that's the sort of system, isn't it, to keep cases out of the courts. They'll have a mediation and decide what's reasonable. And she was pressured at mediation into being compliant. You know, you've got to look like you're trying to do the right thing here, Michelle. You can't stop him having the kids. They're his children. So she actually, in a groundbreaking first at the time, this is 1993, she argued for supervised access, which was a new thing then. When she got it, the mediator agreed that he should be supervised. So for a while, he had a woman who drove him out, a friend who would drive him out to Collie and supervise an afternoon with the kids and then he'd go back home again. Later, that became supervised by his parents, which... Michelle was quite concerned about, not because they couldn't supervise, but because he was such a manipulating, difficult and controlling guy that he would be hard to rein in. He'd still do what he wanted, basically. So she was arguing about that. So when they went to mediation, one of her friends went with her. By then, he'd had a shave and put on a smart suit. And the friends thought he was a lawyer. You know, he looked more like the lawyers than the lawyers did. And Michelle said, no, that's him. And he looked harmless. He was very affable. People weren't seeing what she'd seen. So he was having the kids supervised. And then she went out one day with the children and strapped them in the back of the car, went back in to get her purse that she'd forgotten. And she heard the toilet flushing in her house. And she realized someone was in her house and she knew straight away it was him because he was letting things drop in conversations. She couldn't understand how he knew these things. She crept out of the house, went straight to the local police station, reported an intruder. She said she thought it was him. The police went around, got in the ceiling space where they found him hiding in the ceiling space. And from all the wrappers and empty cans of drink and stuff, he'd been up there a long while. It would have been weeks and weeks. They actually felt sorry for him. It was almost like, poor guy. How desperate is that poor dad to be hiding in the roof space? How desperate is he to see his kids? He must be desperately missing his kids. So what happened was he was arrested, but only after the police allowed him to use her shower, take a shower, get dressed, and then they took him into custody. And she was absolutely appalled. You know, she said they'd been separated months and months and months by then. If that had been a stranger in her roof, he'd have been arrested straight away. But the fact is this guy broke in and he hid in her roof and... You know, he'd been basically spying on her, keeping her under surveillance. He knew she got a new man and he was really unravelling and that scared her. Anyway, no charges were pressed. He gets off with a slap on the wrist. The following day, he's back in the street, unknown to Michelle, hiding in the bush block over the road where he set up a makeshift camp and was continuing by then. They hadn't found the listening devices at that stage. So he was still able to listen to every conversation she had from over the road. And when he realized she was seeing another man, he turns up on her doorstep. He'd wrapped himself in cling film and was threatening to stab himself, take his own life on her doorstep. So she was really freaking out. So, you know, the police are called again. They're persuading him to get help. A new man was at the house and they were pretty freaked out by that. So she goes back to mediation and she's saying, I don't want the kids going there. She stopped access straight away. And they said she had to continue it that, you know, poor guy, needed a bit of help. She was urging him to get counselling, but he wasn't doing that. So then the parents were made the supervising adults in that access arrangement. She was despairing over that. She said that's worse than no access at all. He was then taking the kids to stay overnight. She successfully argued that Wesley, who was still a small baby, was too young to be kept apart from his mother too young to stay overnight with dad, who really had no bond with him because they'd left when he was so young. But it was agreed at mediation, and she had to agree, it was under pressure, that Kelly could continue to go. So the children would go on a Saturday. He would drop Wesley off on a Saturday afternoon at a meeting place locally, and then Kelly would still stay overnight until the Sunday afternoon. And Michelle said, 
you know, she had a heart in her mouth, but what could she do? That was the arrangement that she'd made. So through mediation, Kevin's parents are supposed to be supervising these access visits. Are they supervising them? Well, apparently they were supervising them until they weren't. (laughs) And no one really knows whether that was a one-off and it turned out to be a fatal mistake. But apparently they were supervising him and Kelly was quite happy. And Michelle said Kelly was coming home from her visits to her dad quite animated, sharing all her news about what they'd been doing, really quite sort of happy and dad had taken her here and there and bought her toys and all that sort of thing. So it seemed to be going quite smoothly through the middle to later part of 93. And then it wasn't. And one day Kelly came home from an access visit unusually quiet. Usually she'd come bursting in with all her news. She came in very, very quiet and troubled. And Michelle was bothered by that. And she said, I remember getting her ready for bed and she was sitting in her pyjamas on the sofa with a Roger Ramjet toy. She had this favourite little toy that she took everywhere. And she said, what's wrong, Kel? Like, what's wrong? Is something wrong? And the little girl nodded and she said, I was scared. Dad held a cushion on my face when I was eating a cookie and I couldn't eat my cookie and I couldn't breathe and he wouldn't stop and I was scared and then he took the cushion away and then I could breathe and eat my cookie again but I was scared and Michelle was horrified so this was on a Sunday evening so Monday she rings her solicitor immediately and says that's it she's not going anymore she can't go he's not safe he's tried to smother her And she described what Kelly had said. And little kids say it like it is. And the lawyer said, I was sympathetic, but he said, unfortunately, no one's going to listen to the word of a three-year-old. It's unreliable. It might not have unfolded that way. And Michelle said, you know, out of the mouth of babes, she's a little girl, two and a half. She's telling the truth here. And he said, there's nothing we can do. And that was in November 1993. And her next visit in December 1993 was her last. So on this access visit in December, Wesley and Kelly are dropped off to their dad at a local park. Michelle's sister goes back and picks up Wesley later that afternoon for her. Then the next day they go to pick up Kelly, but that 5pm deadline comes and goes. What happens in the hours and the days after that? Well, Michelle immediately began to panic. And she couldn't get hold of him. She was ringing him and he wasn't answering the phone. She was ringing East to say, where is she? Where is she? I'm I'm getting really scared. Why haven't you brought her back? And that had never happened before. He'd never been late before. And when dark came and there was still no sign of Kelly on the Sunday night, she was really starting to panic. She rang his sister and his sister started to panic too and said, maybe he's been in a car accident because he's never normally late. She just had a, a sixth sense that that wasn't the case. And then she managed to get on to his parents who said, oh, he'd taken Kelly to the beach. And she said, what do you mean he's taken her to the beach? You're supposed to be supervising this. They didn't really have much to say about that. And then she rang the police. And the police were quite concerned too, but it wasn't long enough. You know, it wasn't like she'd been a day late. She was only a few hours late. But I think the police went around to talk to her. And in the meantime, She managed to get a hold of Kevin East and she said, where is Kelly? Why haven't you brought your daughter home? And she said, I've got the police here. You bring her home right now or you're going to be in really serious trouble. And he hung up on her. And for a long time, she tormented herself with that conversation. She wondered if that threat had set him over the edge. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Claire Murphy. I'm speaking with journalist and author Megan Norris about the murder of Kelly Steck, a little girl whose father was out for revenge. I think a lot of people would be hearing how Michelle's case played out, pretty shocked at how much the police had to intervene, but yet he's still a free man able to torment Michelle. Is this another case where... Unless it escalates to a point of no return, police are either unwilling or unable to intervene in these situations? They are unable in some cases because unless there's a court order, which there wasn't in this case, there wasn't a court order, they were not before the courts. It was a mutual arrangement they'd made at mediation. Unless there's a court order, that father has every right to have his child. It's quite common 
during separation for dads to abduct their own kids is also a huge red flag. We now know that. But at a time where there's no court orders in place, and even in more recent cases where there's no court orders in place, the police are powerless. They can go and ask for the child to be returned, but they can't enforce it. If the dad says, no, I've got every right to have my child. Even though he'd been before the courts for essentially living in her roof space, bugging her house, threatening to take his life on her doorstep, none of that was taken into consideration? No charges were ever brought. It was always given a slap on the wrist and sent on his way. He never was charged with breaking into her home or stalking her. I don't know that the stalking legislation was introduced at that time. It was shortly after in WA. But he's never been charged with anything. He wasn't breaking any supervision order or breaking any court orders. He wasn't in breach of a probation order. There was nothing to stop him doing these things. So the police basically said, wait and see. But she just knew and she started to panic. When she eventually got a hold of him and told him to return Kelly immediately because the police were at her home, I'm not sure that they were at that stage, he panicked and hung up on her and she's tormented herself over that for a long time. She then rang the police back and said, he's not bringing her home and I'm really worried. In the meantime, he'd bolted with his daughter, put her in the four-wheel drive and drove, what, 200 kilometres into the bush near a township called Beverly in the middle of nowhere, and he drove into dense bush. He took the trouble to camouflage the car with branches and foliage so that basically he was making it really hard for anyone to find them in the future. And he ran a length of hose pipe from the car exhaust into the car, pulled the window up, and turned the ignition on, and they died of the fumes from the exhaust. But before that, he took the time to actually record his little girl's dying moments. So he kept this journal and he recorded everything in the journal, basically to maximise any suffering he would be causing to Michelle so that when they were found, that diary would be evidence to add to her pain. It was a very calculated crime and he must have been mulling it over over the weekend because she didn't know at the time until afterwards but over the course of that weekend he took Kelly shopping there's a photo of her which Michelle never saw until after her death after they were discovered they found photos that Kevin East had taken that she'd never seen of Kelly pushing a little shopping trolley full of toys and gifts so he'd showered her with all these gifts that she would never get to play with and he knew that He bought her all these gifts, took photos of her smiling, which Michelle was given by the police after the funeral. She'd never seen those photos. And he also went to the local post office and he posted a parcel to Michelle. And in the parcel were a couple of tapes that were very significant to him and to her. One was the song My Michelle by the Beatles. And the other recording was Sweet Child of Mine which it was almost a chilling message, you know, that he was reclaiming, you're my Michelle, this is my child, sort of reclaiming the family he'd lost and reclaiming some of his lost control over Michelle and the children, who he actually viewed as their possessions to do with what they wished. And he also, in another recording in that parcel, it was a rant that he'd made, blaming her for everything, telling her how awful she was, that she'd driven him to this, it was all her fault, And it was just a rant. He also posted to the Western Australian newspaper some material. I'm not sure whether they were recordings or letters, but basically he was complaining about the rights of fathers being trashed in separation, that, you know, he was an angry dad and he hadn't been treated fairly and he'd been deprived of access to his children, none of which was true. He'd always been given access to his children. And he actually killed Kelly on an access visit. And the fact that Michelle argued that Wesley was too young saved his life, or he would have no doubt killed Wesley also. But he posted that to the Western Australian. They actually ran it, this ranting, awful, blaming letter. And he also sent photos of Michelle during her pregnancy, embarrassing photographs of her breastfeeding after the baby was born, or photos of her in stages of undress to publicly humiliate her. I think he may have sent that to her employer. He took a number of steps over the course of that weekend. And ironically, she never got those chilling tapes until after Kelly disappeared. 
you point out in the book this incredible moment. It's just after three o'clock in the morning and Michelle sits up in bed and just screams and says she's gone. And everyone around her is trying to calm her down. This is before they find the bodies. Everyone's trying to calm her down and tell her that it's fine, that she's just panicking, she's been under a lot of stress. But what did they find in Kevin East's horrible diary found at the scene of the murder that correlates with that moment that Michelle has woken up in the middle of the night? It was like a sixth sense. And, you know, I find that quite incredible because a number of the mothers whose children were murdered describe that same feeling. You know, they talk about cell memory that in the womb, the mother's cells go past through the umbilical cord and the placenta to the baby. And it's that cell memory that gives you that bond before the child is even born. And she said she woke in the middle of the night with this gripping feeling that she had gone, that something terrible had happened. And she was inconsolable. She really believed that. And when they found Kevin East's diary, she was right. And that's around the time that he'd recorded his daughter's death. And then, of course, he died shortly after from exhaust fumes too, but she was absolutely spot on. That is the time of death. He really prolonged the agony. It was bad enough what he did. It was hideous. But he prolonged Michelle's suffering because it took some time for the car to be found. So he'd camouflaged it very well. No one had a clue where he'd gone. Michelle had the most awful, awful December right through Christmas a new year where she'd done all this shopping for Kelly. All her presents were wrapped under the Christmas tree. And she'd bought all these little figurines because Kelly collected these little China figurines of Cinderella and things. And Michelle had bought her favourite figurines and she'd wrapped them, all these gifts under the Christmas tree. And day after day, there was no news. Michelle went to court and they issued an Australia-wide alert, a manhunt for the disappearing dad and this little girl. So Michelle was on the news. I watched the news footage. She was on the ABC appealing for him to bring Kelly back. But in her heart, she knew that Kelly had gone. She just knew. And she was distraught. So, you know, she said Christmas was just awful. And it was like this limbo of waiting for bad news because she didn't believe the news was ever going to be positive. She always believed it was bad news. And watching Wesley toddling by then, he was toddling and speaking He was toddling from room to room, calling Kelly's name, looking for his big sister. And she said it just ripped her heart out. That limbo lasted about three weeks until Kelly was finally found. Might have been a month before Kelly was finally found. And a bushwalker off the beaten track found the car and alerted the police. And they'd been there in the heat of summer in WA, right through December into January, about 13th of January, thereabouts, that they were found. And... It was terrible. You know, the police came to deliver the news, but she knew. And she said, you know, they were searching all over Australia. They were on the TV. She was begging for him to bring her back. But she knew in her heart that she'd gone. What did police say after Kevin and Kelly's bodies were found? Did they at all take that opportunity to reflect on how many times they could have intervened in this case? No, it had gone from the local Collie police to the Perth police. You know, it was a statewide thing. It went to detectives. It went to a different division. And they were very hardened detectives on that case, involved with the discovery of, well, the search for Kelly and the discovery of Kevin East and his daughter, were very affected by that case. It affected, seriously affected a number of those officers, and especially the diary that they found. And... Michelle was only very young. You know, she was in her very early 20s when this happened. And she said that they told her that this diary had been found. And she said she wanted to see it. Because you find that with parents when they've lost a child, they haven't had the chance to say goodbye. They feel they failed. They weren't there to protect that child. They feel it's their fault, you know. And she wanted to see that diary. She wanted to know everything. And they said, don't go there. Don't read it. He wanted you to read it he's written this to hurt you more and there are some things better not to know and she did take that advice but because of the state of decomposition of the bodies and the length of time it had taken in the heat of summer to find them 
there was nothing for her to say goodbye to. So that was a really big deal for her. She wanted to see her daughter's body and say goodbye, not understanding how that wouldn't be possible. The coroner or someone from the police said it was just too late. There was nothing really to see. She was better to look at her photographs and remember the little girl she'd known and loved than to torment herself with those sorts of images. That was a big deal, even at the funeral. I remember being quite upset as she discussed this. It was terrible. She'd stood at the graveside at Collie Church watching, and the priest held her hand. This upsets me, and it still upsets me, watching Kelly being lowered into the ground, and she said, there's always that denial and disbelief when these things happen, because none of it feels real. But she said, I didn't know what they were burying. I couldn't believe it was my daughter because I hadn't seen her to say goodbye. I never got to kiss her goodbye. I never got to hold her. I just wondered, is that even my daughter you're lowering into the ground? What are you even lowering into the ground? And Kevin East was buried somewhere else, I think a few days later. But she said, I wanted to dig him up and kill him all over again. I was so angry. I was so angry. It's very powerful stuff. And the grief, the grief is enduring. And when I wrote the book originally in 2015, I asked for the photos after I'd written the book. I couldn't look at the photos and write the book because those pictures make these little people so real because they're all real. I wrote the book, filed the manuscript, and then I get the photos and then I caption the photos. And it was gut-wrenching. It was absolutely gut-wrenching looking through all these little faces so full of dreams and all the dreams Michelle had for her, all the things she would never do. You know, she would, Kelly would never start school. She would never know what it was like to drive a car, or have a job or get married. It was absolutely terrible, forever pain. And that is what these crimes are about, inflicting a suffering almost worse than your own death. A lot of those women, you ask them and they say that. A, a criminologist told me that a long time ago. She would ask mothers what's the worst thing that your partner could possibly do to you and you know far worse than their own death or being doused in acid or set on fire was having their children murdered because the thought of having your children murdered just to punish you for ending a very abusive relationship was the absolute worst thing any of those women could imagine and you know it's true because all the women that I've spoken to will say the same thing It's a death sentence, but it's slow, slow death, and it's a slow punishment. And for some of them, you know, Michelle said, people say these guys don't win, but from the minute they commit that crime, they do. They've won. You know, she was a very young, dynamic woman, and she was so angry. So in the weeks that followed the funeral, she was in Canberra knocking on doors, lobbying, campaigning, talking to news crews, lobbying politicians. She even joined local politics and became a politician. She actually formed a grief group for mothers who'd lost children, not just through murder, but through road accidents and other natural causes. She formed a grief group and found that quite therapeutic for herself to be helping herself and other people. But, you know, every year on that anniversary, she would go and visit Kelly's grave and she said, I lose myself for weeks afterwards because you never, ever get over it. That's the nature of these crimes, and that's something that people just don't understand. They would say, what would cause a loving dad to kill his own flesh and blood? He must be ill. You know, he's got to be unbalanced or mentally ill. And, you know, they're not. They're angry. They're so angry. And any love they might feel for their children is really outweighed by the hatred that they feel for the ex-wife. And it's that that drives it. It overshadows any common sense. It's absolute revenge. Wesley has now grown up with the spectre of his sister in the house with him. And Michelle has gone on to have more children since. How has Kelly's death impacted her as a mother to these other kids? Well, she said it was very, very hard. And all the mothers have said the same thing because... The joy of a new child, you know, the joy of welcoming a new baby is greatly overshadowed by the reminders of your loss. She did marry the man she was with when Kevin East took Kelly and they did have three more children. And it's been hard for those children too. You know, she said that it's been hard. One of them especially was born very close to 
Kelly's birthday and feels an affinity with a sister that they never knew. So those children also have grown up with the spectre of a child, of a sister that they never got to know. And she said, I was a mess. You know, she was an absolute mess for a long time. And the marriage didn't work. It didn't last very long. And and she said it never was going to. She said we didn't stand a chance because she was so consumed by grief. And Wesley really grieved for his sister. She said, you think as little toddlers, they wouldn't be so affected, but he really was. And that broke her heart too for him. And then she went on to have more children who grow up in a house where there's an older sister that they'll never know. And she talks about that sister and goes to visit a grave where she loses herself for weeks at a time, year after year. And she's really lobbying for change, calling for change. I knew her from years ago when this happened. And she was part of a big campaign called Blood on Whose Hands. There were lobbies all over the country where women wore red T-shirts and covered in pretend paint, you know, and were protesting over the rules that courts were making that were putting children at risk every day, continuing to put children like Kelly at risk. And Michelle was very active in that. I think she sort of busied herself with trying to make a difference and she always will. And she's so supportive of this book. She is so supportive of it. And and she said, you know, when I said I was updating and re-releasing it, she was so supportive. And she wrote me the most heartbreaking letter saying, you know, we're so grateful that you've never forgotten us. You've never walked away and forgotten us. It never became just another book you wrote. You're still there banging that drum, making a noise with us. And we are so grateful. She wrote a testimonial for the book and, it, you know, she said, we're the women who cry. We're the ones who, whenever we see another family on the news that could have been saved, will sit and cry for days because it takes us right back to where we were and it's still happening. So it was very hard for those children. And she's now a grandma. She told me the other day she's now become a grandma. And she said, it's wonderful to become a grandma. And it's wonderful that my kids have grown up. And I'm proud of Wesley. I'm proud of all the children. But it never takes away from everything you've lost and all the milestones her younger children have celebrated, having jobs, finding partners, having babies. They're all things that she was robbed of celebrating with Kelly. They're all things Kelly will never get to do. So it takes away everything. It sort of robs you of any future joy. I think that's the thing. You find joy. Otherwise, if you don't live, then they did win. If you don't reclaim your life and live it and find new happiness, then they won. But at some level, they do, though, because it is a forever grief. If you'd like to hear more about this case, I had a one-on-one conversation with Michelle Steck. He was sinister. He didn't do this because he flipped out emotionally and flipped out psychologically and all these words that people want to put to it. He knew what he was doing. He knew that whatever he did, it was out for punishment for me and that was the only reason why he did it, the only reason. That conversation is available just for Mamma Mia subscribers. To find out more, follow the link in our show notes. Thanks to Megan for her assistance in telling the story. Megan will be joining us for the next few weeks to take us through some more cases of Australian retaliatory filicide, outlining the ways in which the system lets women and children down in the worst possible ways. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Claire Murphy. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Our audio design is by Madeline Joannou. If you've enjoyed our behind-the-scenes of crime special, let us know by leaving a review in your favourite podcast app or sending an email to truecrime at mamamia.com.au.